Genetics and the knowledge of genetics was restricted to a very specialized journal, ophthalmic genetics, IOVS, and then it became mainline in our uh, academy. This is uh, Throwaway. It's a magazine put out by the American Academy of Ophthalmology. Um, archives of ophthalmology then followed. Actually, it was two issues devoted to genetics. And ophthalmology, which is the publication of the American Academy of Ophthalmology, we can see that became front page, front cover. Even the uh, media for the populace, genetics, genetics, genetics. So our patients are becoming knowledgeable in genetics, so we've got to go and catch up to them because they're asking the questions and they uh, hopefully expect that we have the answers. I wonder if there's a laser pointer here. Um, at first, um, I want to go into something interesting. People are always interested in sex, so I'll start with uh, how confusing the study of genetics could be. Here's the um, sex-determining uh, region of the Y uh, chromosome. And we can see that um, the uh, SRY area is uh, further down here. And this is important because here, this is um, magnification of where it is. And we can see the genes that are present for it. And there's frequent exchanges in the germ cells. But if it stays in the same person, you don't notice it. But the rare exchange is what can cause problems. Because you could have a male without the SRY gene if it crosses over, and this could carry through to his progeny. And um, same with the female, where you could have a female having that SRY gene without anything to neutralize it. And then let's say we have a person that's totally normal genetically, but the adrenal gland is acting up. You have insufficiency, lack of testosterone, and an effeminate male. Overaction, you have a masculine female. So genetics is really not that easy. It is very complicated. And that's why it takes real experts, like our panel, to sort it out. As I said, People are getting this knowledge from the um, consumer media. And so everyone's interested in genetics. Now that the testing is becoming so less expensive, and the uh, children, everyone wants to know, how am I going to develop? What diseases am I going to have? What am I going to carry forward? So we had this little chap with all this stuff. And um, we can see that we have even decoding the disease what you could be getting. Why is this flipping so fast? Okay, for decoding of the disease, you could have all these interesting uh, problems and yet get none of them, if, uh, even if it's in your genetic code. And you'll find out why later in this course, later in my talk. Here's an example. I had my DNA picture taken. This was two years ago. Uh, but nothing turned out, and there were different companies producing the genome for uh, those that wanted it, and they were conflicting. And here's one of them, 23andMe, a very famous company, uh, the wife of one of the Google founders, and uh, they had to suspend their health-related genetic tests because uh, of um, regulatory processes. They really weren't that accurate, and they were misleading the patients. So, then we have the genome-wide association study that wanted to pinpoint, just like our patients, to pinpoint DNA changes responsible for common diseases. And that was disappointing because of genetic variations um, and all the interactions that you'll see later. Here's a couple of reasons. Some polygenic common diseases like cancer and diabetes could be caused by various genes. Also, uh, we have multifactorial environment, hormones, etc. On top of it, let's take one of the uh, diseases that we're going to be discussing. Look at this range of uh, genes. I am pushing down on the 
change instead of on the laser pointer. Okay, I won't use the laser pointer. But we can see that the same genes are uh, responsible for uh, multiple diseases. Here's one with uh, glaucoma that Dr. Sanderson will be talking about later. Various genes responsible, myelin, open angle glaucoma. Uh, early on, WDR36, open angle glaucoma now, optineuron, normal tension glaucoma. And then we're concerned about uh, beyond ophthalmology, the war on bioterrorism of uh, unexpected infections with DNA, threat of newly engineered microbes that are coming on, family planning, prenatal testing, embryo selection, IVF, colleague of mine in the 40s, his wife had IVF, two fantastic tw twins, one boy, one girl. Uh, and cloning, of course, um, donated ov ovums with DNA from a surrogate. So, again, one of the purposes of genetic studies is to reach a point at which we know about a person's genetics so we could develop specific therapeutic strategies for that individual. That's what we hope to do. So many uh, medications with the side effects, it's wasted on patients and not getting better, while a certain selection might target it exactly. So let's begin our little crash course in genetics. Um, I highlighted in red what's important. It's only 1% to 5% of base pairs, so the 3 billion base pairs that code for protein. The rest are... We don't call it junk anymore because that has a function too. Now the differences in genome from one person to another is only about a tenth of a percent and you only differ from a chimpanzee by two percent. Um, I'm going into lengths, a centimorgan. Why do we talk about a million base pairs? Um, well, because those are the crossing overs and the frequency of it crossing over. With a Morgan, you should get one crossing over for every uh, meiosis. Centimorgan would be a one in a hundred. And uh, another way that we can look at a centimorgan is it encloses about one million base pairs. So a centimorgan has two different types of uh, measurements. The rest of this is in your uh, handouts, so uh, you could always uh, refer to this later on. Here we have uh, meiosis, and um, we can see how we have crossing overs, and um, we could see that this is in the male, where we get uh, four chromatids. And uh, here's another picture of it with the same way. Uh, I won't go into the various phases, like telophase, metaphase, is the one that we usually picture with two chromatids attached with the centomere and the anaphase. But it's quite different for a female. Spermatogenesis on the left, as I said, we get four chromatids. But with the woman, sure, they split up the same way. But on the lower left, you can see that the... Um, I need help on this. Um, some of the chromatids are destroyed. Polar body one, polar body two. So after all the divisions, there's only one um, oocyte that's left. Not four of them, just one. All the others are destroyed. Moreover, in a woman, X chromosomes, these are mosaics shown in a female rat but only one of those X chromosomes is really functional. One of them dominates, the other sort of melts away. I want to go into translocation for a second because here we have a translocation of uh, two different chromosomes crossing over, chromosome 4 and 20. Uh, in the same individual, it makes no difference, but if this is in the germ cells, it can carry forward and you would get genetic abnormalities. I told you about the metaphase, and let's take a look at this. We can see that the count starts in the center from the centromere down. The uh, top part is the uh, short arm, the P arm. Do you know why it's called the P arm? Anyone knows French? 
it comes from petite, petite. So it's called the P arm, and the other one is the Q arm. Uh, don't ask me how it got the letter Q, but I think it's only because of PQ and the alphabet. And at the end, we have the telomeres, and again, we have sister chromatids. And if you look at the spread, 23 and me, you have the largest as number one, and the shortest should be uh, uh, number uh, 22, but it's a little bit bigger than 21, and then finally the germs at the bottom. And they're all wrapped up in histones, and uh, that has some importance later as I uh, describe it. And here's a much better picture of how all of this could be wrapped up in the chromatids. All this is in your handouts. Mitochondria. Mitochondria, um, these really uh, came from ancient bacteria that uh, became engulfed in today's nucleated cells. And um, the DNA in that is sort of similar to uh, bacteria, uh, but it produces its own RNA in the Krebs cycle and it regulates ap apoptosis. But it's more important. They're circular, and you could have many of them inside a cell. And um, we could track ancestry with that. It's mostly maternal inheritance. Why? Because in the sperm, um, that is uh, the mitochondria, it's in the tail. And the tail usually breaks off at the time of penetrance, so the tail of the sperm is lost. So the uh, mitochondria that a uh, person gets is uh, from the mother. And you'll see that in a minute. At the bottom, only 37 genes are in the mitochondria, and that's important because look at this. Of those, um, three of them refer to ophthalmology. And we also, in general, why do we study the eye so much in genetics? Well, 90% of the, gene of the gen genetics that's uh, translated into proteins, it's all in the eye, whether it's in function or in structure. It's uh, genetic. And it, we can see it in the eye, and an eye is a very simple organ to work with. You can see the back of it. It's right in front of you. You don't have to stick needles into it. And also, a lot of function, like um, color blindness, comes from genetics. So we have three conditions, Leber's hereditary optic neuropathy, um, uh, chronic progressive external ophthalmopathy, uh, you can't move your eyes left, right, up, or down, and you get ptosis, and finally Kern-Serra syndrome. But we're not going to go into that. But we can see the pedigree of that. Take a look. It's all maternal. All the inheritance is maternal. Black. Uh, it could be passed on to a male, but the males cannot pass uh, the uh, genetic uh, mutations on to the prodigy. And compare that to... Uh, this type of pedigree, and this happens to be um, that family that got me interested in genetics from Cornea Plana. Um, the arrow is the um, proband that introduced the family, family treats my practice. Um, and we can see that that's the fourth generation, the third generation on top. We could not trace the family tree further up, so we think that number two, the mother, is the one that... Um, had a mutation in the germ cells that carried through. And we can see that there's one child at the end which was uh, not affected. And if you take a look at this, you could see that she had two mates. So even though she had two mates, we still had the genetic abnormalities. Actually, she had a third one. And that child also was not affected. So here she had three mates of which two with the mates uh, became our positive. So let's go into a little more basis. Basic genetics. We, it's, the um, bases are broken up into purines and pyrimidines, and I like this color code. Adenine, green, thymine, red, guanine, black, and cytosine, blue. And when we uh, get um, chromograms, for analysis, it's important. I'll show that later. Then we have the carbons, and we have the um, sugars. And with that, we get desoxyribose and ribose, with the only difference is that um, ribose has the hydroxyl group, while deoxyribose, by definition, only has a hydrogen and not an oxygen. 
and when you put phosphate on it, we call it a nucleotide. And again, we have the purines and pyrimidines. And when we, uh, the DNA is transferred to an RNA, the thymine becomes uracil. And we can see that a pyrimidine only hooks up with, uh, with a purine. Adenine with thymine and cytosine with guanine. The backbone is the phosphate. And we can see the binding between the uh, purine, which has uh, three uh, binds, three hydrogen binds, and the pyrimidine that has two. So what does this mean? It means that the um, hookup between adenine and thymine is a little bit weaker than the triple bond between cytosine and guanine. And here's a better picture of that. We can see the hookups, the triples, and the doubles of the four bases. So, how do we read this? We call it an open reading frame. Three-letter codons, and this is important. Um, we have, uh, always start at the second letter, the owl and the cat, etc., etc., and um, it's always got to be in triples. This has significance, because that is translated into the amino acids, and we have 20 amino acids, but so many of them have um, different um, codons, yet it still translates into the uh, same amino acid. An amino acid will generally start with methionine. That's the start codon. And if there's a change in the sequence of the codon, uh, it stops. We get stop codons like uh, UAA, UGA, and UAG. Those are the stops. We'll go into that in a minute. And here we can see how the different amino acids look, their formulas. All this is in your handout. We have, um, for transcription into amino acids, um, no, into RNA, um, the introns, which are the non-coding areas, and the exons that are, the introns are eliminated during transcription into messenger RNAs. So they sort of become efficient. They get rid of the so-called junk areas. It's not junk. Go into that later. Translation, excuse me for my uh, malaprop before, is the translation of the um, amino acids and the uh, RNA into proteins. So here we have the sense strand, the original strand, and against that we'll get the antisense, just the opposite. We can see the AT on the left, TA, and uh, with transcription becoming RNA, the messenger RNA, the only difference is the thymine becomes uracil, but it's the same sequence. You can see that. And so that is what the basis of the messenger RNA is that goes into the cytoplasm. And with that, we'll get the various amino acids, beginning with methionine on the left. And finally, the transfer RNA. Here's a better picture of it. And again, I said different coding. So we get a frame shift. What is a frame shift? If a base is inserted or deleted, that changes the codons, and eventually you'll get a stop codon, and you won't get your amino acid. Or we could get a missense, where if we just change one of the uh, one of the bases, if we change one of them, um, we can still get a protein, but we get a disease like sickle cell or hemolytic anemia. Again, if you eliminate one or the other, or add one or the other, it becomes garbage. You can't read it. You've still got to read in the same sequence of threes, and therefore you don't get your amino acid and protein. So this is called nonsense, which is any deletion or addition in a codon that results in a stop codon, and you can see the diseases. And a good article on this is Genomics on the Eye in uh, New England Journal of Medicine 2011. It's in your handouts, I think. So what controls gene expression? Remember that we could have genes and mutants, but we could have silences and promoters in other areas. Genes elsewhere could regulate the uh, disease gene, positive or negative. 
And so uh, I talked about junk DNA. No longer. We have an encyclopedia of DNA elements called ENCODE. And it describes all the functional elements in it. And it talks about the switches, some of those so-called introns. They're the regulators. They could regulate. And it controls the behavior of cells, tissues, and organs. And it can be affected by the environment. Which now brings me to epigenetics, over and above. Because it's hereditary changes, if it's in the uh, germ cells, caused by mechanisms other than changes in the underlying DNA sequence. So your DNA could be the same, but you're getting changes in it. <clears throat> so that's the difference between Darwin, evolution as a result of genetic changes, and epigenetics, which is gene expression from external influences. Lamarck was the one who formulated this, and I think Lamarck actually preceded Darwin, if I'm not mistaken. So here we have this nice giraffe, and why did their neck get long? Well, they had to eat from the top of the trees. And we get markers, methyl groups and acetyl groups, and uh, this is what makes the changes epigenetics. So here we have the methyl group on the histone. As the histone unwinds, it attaches to the uh, tails, and this is what could cause uh, changes, um, cancer, autoimmune diseases, diabetes, etc. And uh, other thing, what could cause this? Environmental chemicals, drugs, yes, pharmaceuticals, agings, and diets. Uh, sequencing, we've got to have the order of bases in the segment of DNA. And with that, with, uh, quite a while ago, and even now, the polymerase. A uh, chain reaction is the way that we determine this, and this is how we worked with my family. Uh, we uh, extract the DNA, DNA, heat it up, break up the um, um, sequence, amplify it with the cycle, and finally confirm it with electrophoresis. And with that, we get our uh, beautiful um, uh, chrome, uh, chrome, uh, chromogram. Now, why is it important? Well, we can see over here a change where um, cytosine is substituted for adenine in 191. And we can see from our electrophoresis how that works. There's other methods, microarrays that Dr. Sanderson will be talking about briefly, uh, that we could do uh, a huge amount of analyses. And finally, these faster high-volume uh, sequences, this is... Uh, at Cornell University, where I graduated, and we can see that uh, they have a room full of it. And of course, the cost per genome is going down, and we have data deluge, and maybe computers could help us out because a computer could absorb all this knowledge, absorb all the journals, and help us um, work with us, not replace us, not replicate us, but in consortium with us, help with the patient's diagnosis and treatment. Now, we go into tissue engineering, DNA gene replacement, and pluripotent-induced and embryonic stem cells, which I just want to go into briefly. Genome sequencing would be the identification of mutant genes by specific novel therapy, which I told you about. Tissue engineering is replacement of defective tissue with cultured stem cells, and a lot of work is being done here in India especially uh, L.V. Prasad and other places, and Karen Nathralia. And this is um, one in which we have regenerated epithelium um, from uh, stem cells, and we can see how normal it looks. Molecular therapeutics, DNA gene replacement, and it may not be in my lifetime, and it, but it may be in your lifetime where the treatment of disease will be with the replacement of genes. And that would be somatic, which you introduce it into the somatic system for just that one patient. Or if uh, you suspect it would be in the germline, uh, this will be carried through to the offspring. And I mentioned that the eye has advantages over other systems for gene research because it's easy to see, relatively immunoprivileged, and uh, just a little bit of uh, work has to, uh, doses have to be given because the eye is so small. And we use vectors for gene transfer. Um, 
the adenoviruses, adeno-associated viruses, depends upon what you're working with, uh, liposomes, and this is for the trabecular meshwork where the, uh, uh, what's used, uh, plasmids, and for glaucoma, and I don't want to interfere with uh, Dr. Sunderson's work, but we can see the advantages and limitations of different types of vectors. Adenovirus gives prolonged transgene, um, but you can get an inflammatory response. In this. Um, a lot of work is being done on the retina. The injection is given in the vitreous and sometimes subretinal. And here's a lot of the adeno-associated um, uh, capsids that we um, use. Uh, two or three of them are used for ophthalmology, like number nine, where the arrow is. Um, it's put in the vector, usually a single strand, and we can see this little capsid being captured, being carried down through the vitreous, loses its shell, enters the nucleus, and then after a second one with the second strand is injected, we get a protein, a replacement protein. And uh, the, now to go into stem cells, the blastocyst is for pluripotent cells for work for developing um, new s cell lines and the area of your body will determine what type of tissue is generated. Now that's one type. We have uh, induced stem cell tissues and um, I did mention that the embryonic stem cells come from the cultured blastocytes but if we have, and another type is unfertilized, parthenogenic, and this work is being done at Sankara Nathralia, and tissue has been generated, and the induced pluripotent stem cells are something else where you take the patient's own fibroblasts, you could uh, then turn it into stem cells, and then redirect it to the uh, organ. Now this is a corneal orb that came from um, a parthenogenic, uh, Dr. Kusumakar uh, was, uh, I think he's still at Sankara Nathralia, and the work is being done also in California. So we get terminal blasts, transcription factors, uh, COXI2, OCT4, will form it into the induced pluripotent stem cells, and then certain proprietary portions that companies won't tell us what's in it will regenerate into various adult cells and organs that you want to replace. And even the whole eye. Um, can be regenerated. Uh, it was an ophthalmology, an ophthalmology, that publication worthy of reading and some references, and I want to thank you. I'll introduce Dr.